Philippians chapter 9. We have been sharing a short series on the faithful witness and some helps that we need to witness and tell others about Jesus Christ. Before we read, there was a lady who was speeding in a small little town in Georgia, as it is told, as a true story, and she was traveling at the rate of 70 miles per hour in a 55. I I almost don't call that speeding, but that's how... I shouldn't say that. That, don't, don't follow that example or anything. But, the, but anyway, that's how the story goes. And the, the police pulled this lady over and wrote her a ticket. And that ticket was going to end up costing her $100. She didn't have $100, so she had to show up in court. And she showed up in court before the judge. And, and he, said, uh, he said, you're guilty, we see here, of of speeding, you're doing 70 and a 55, and the, and the cost for this is $100, and she said, I don't have $100, I am guilty of speeding, and, and I did that, but, but I do not have the $100, can, can you have some mercy on me? And he said, the law is the law, and, and so you were speeding 70 and a 55, so... So the rules are the rules. So you're going to have to pay the $100 or you're going to have to spend the weekend in jail. And she said, her voice started breaking up. She got a little weaker and she said, I really don't want to spend the the weekend locked up. And and I do not have $100. Can, Can you please do something for me? And the judge looked at her and he, he unzipped his robe and he went and put on his jacket, and he went down, and he stood beside her, and he pulled a $100 bill out of his wallet, and he set it on the bench in front of them, and he went back and put his, took his jacket off, and and put his robe back on, and zipped it up, and went before her, and from the other side again, and said, you have broken the law, you are, you are, have been clocked at speeding, 70 and a 55, and you owe $100. That's the law, or you go to jail for the weekend. But I see that someone has paid your fine for you, and so you are free to go. And you know, God saw everyone traveling down the highway of sin, and and, and He... He unclothed Himself from His deity, if you will, and He put on His jacket of humanity, and He came down to us, and He died on the cross, and He paid a price that you and I could not pay. He picked up the tab, He arose from the dead, and He went and zipped up His glorified body, and He ascended to heaven. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus came to us and He paid a fine that we could not pay. It has been paid, our sin debt has, by by the Lord Himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And that is very good news. The Apostle Paul was amazed at this good news. He believed this good news. He received this good news. He received the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as His Savior by faith. And he immediately had compassion upon those who did not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Let's read just for a second about Paul's passion for those who were unsaved. Romans 9, 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. 
that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why? For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. To be a faithful witness to those who are lost, which is what we are to be. It's what we're called to be. It's what we're put here to be. Two weeks ago, we shared that it, that it takes prayer. It takes prayer to be a faithful witness. First, pray before anything. And then it takes faith. I mean, the faith of that Gentile woman whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil, and Jesus gave her the silent treatment. Jesus shunned her in a, as far as the way it sounded and the appearance by His words, but she was going nowhere else and no one would help but Jesus. And He said, great is thy faith. We need, we need a faithful prayer life. We need that kind of faith. And in order to be a faithful witness, we must have compassion for the unsaved. There must be a compassion there for us to be a faithful witness. It takes compassion to be moved with pity and love toward those who are without Christ. And so tonight I want to talk about what will bring about compassion, because that's something from heaven. That's not something we're born with. That's not something we naturally have for, uh, for the unsaved. And, and also, a little bit about what compassion will bring about in our lives after it's brought about in our life. You know, we know God had compassion for us because He gave His Son that outward showing of compassion, the action of His compassion for us was giving His Son for us. Think about what went inside, what went on inside the heart of God in His compassion for us. The outward expression of that compassion, well, He gave His Son for us. Just think about the heart of God looking upon a lost and dying human race that... that he had to do something about because of His love. We know He had compassion for us. The Lord Jesus wept over us. And with compassion, He, dry, he died on a cruel cross. The Holy Spirit draws those to a place of realizing their need to be saved. It takes a weeping witness to be a faithful witness. Every church must have within the leadership and within the body compassion for the unsaved. You, we sometimes know of a church or go to a church for whatever reason and, and, and unfortunately sometimes there's a, there's a coldness there. Or... Or there is a, you, you might say the church is stagnant. Why is that? Well, one cause of that could be lack of compassion for the lost. You know, a main ingredient for an evangelistic heart is going to be compassion. We, you know, why, why, why does the witness fade with some? They, they go out and go through the motions of it, and then it's just done. A lack of compassion for the lost. This is something we really need. If we're going to be a faithful witness and if we're going to fulfill our calling, our purpose on this earth after being saved, before we go to glory, we desperately need compassion for the unsaved. And so what will bring about that? Well, two lessons ago was prayer. Falling upon our knees in prayer. This is a product of heaven and we need it to fulfill our purpose. We, we, need to, we need to let the Lord know how much we know we need compassion in our hearts for those who are unsaved. But not only falling on our needs in prayer, but feeding on the Word of God. We're going to have compassion that's going to come about that way. How do we live lives 
full of compassion for the unsaved, there's no way to miss it in the Scriptures. There's no way to miss God's heart, God's long-suffering, His compassion for the unsaved when we go through the Bible. God's mercy for the lost is all through His Word. God sought the lost through the ministry of Jesus. He's drawn the lost through the function and work of the Holy Spirit. And He uses the evangelistic efforts of His people in order for others to be saved. When we read of God's compassion for the lost and, and, and all He has done that the lost might be saved, there's no way that you and I are going to resist having compassion for the lost. But not only will this compassion come about by feeding on the Word of God, but by fellowship with Jesus. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Man, that, that mature ox was in the yoke and they put that young ox in the yoke with him and that young ox couldn't go do what he wanted or what he was thinking about. He had to follow the other ox in the yoke. And he learned from him. He learned how to work. And when we get in the yoke with Jesus and walking with Him and learning of Him, how will we not be enthusiastic about reaching lost souls? That's what He did while He walked this earth. That's what we have a three and a half year earthly ministry account about that Jesus did. What else will bring about compassion, though, is being in submission to the Holy Spirit of God. The leadership of the Holy Spirit is leading our lives. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to lead and to guide us. He leads and guides us into all truth, and my Bible tells me that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. As we consider the function of the Holy Spirit, convicting the world of sin, drawing lost souls to see their need of salvation. Look, if we're going to be led of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be sensitive to the ministry of leading others, leading the lost to be saved. We're going, if we're walking in the Spirit, we are going to have a compassion for the lost because the Holy Spirit is convicting the lost. But, but not only will that bring about compassion, but footsteps in the work. Footsteps in the work of soul winning. You need all of these other things. Of course, we need prayer. We need to feed on the Word of God. We need fellowship with Jesus, submission to the Spirit. But nothing will fill a heart more quickly full of compassion than do, doing the work of a faithful witness. To get out there and just start telling others about Jesus. You know, to hear someone face to face with you reject the message of Jesus you give them as the only plan, the only way to be saved, they reject it and then they tell you of a way they think they can get to heaven. And some method that's going to get them to heaven. To walk away from an engagement like that is no doubt going to cultivate a deep passion within us for lost souls. One Christian really didn't have too much of a passion about a cult. They didn't know about this cult. They weren't sure if this so-called cult was really a cult. But they were a young Christian out witnessing with another Christian, and they ran across this cult. And, and this person in this cult finally got frustrated with the conversation that was going on, and they said, we don't want to go to heaven. 
And as a result of that statement, by the way, there's a cult out there that believes that, that when you die, your body, spirit, soul, everything is soul sleep in the ground. And when Jesus comes back, everything, body, soul, spirit, is going to raise from the grave and inherit this earth. There's a cult that believes that. But they didn't know the details about this cult. And when they heard this person say, well, we don't want to go to heaven, this young Christian has had a burden for that cult ever since they heard that. And how, how did that come about? It came about by footsteps in the work. Out sharing Jesus with someone else. You know, on, on the other hand, concerning be out, being out there in the work and what leads us to compassion for another, when a lost soul receives the message of Jesus Christ, and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right then and there as their personal Savior, you can't wait to go tell someone else about Jesus. And it goes on and on and on, and it creates a longing to tell just another soul and another soul about Jesus. And then next thing you know, we are consumed with sharing Jesus Christ with others. I went to a Bible conference several years ago, and by the way, for the story I'm about to tell you, it was a very conservative Bible conference. It, it was actually a grace. And, and there was a Spanish ministry that had started up, and, and this man got up to preach, and, and he, he preached an amazing sermon. But before that, he just started giving a little testimony, introducing himself. He didn't know the, many of the churches. He didn't know many of the preachers. And he started talking about how he had first got saved. And in the bulletin or the announcement, they said, Remember visitation Saturday. And this baby Christian said, What in the world is visitation? And they said, we're going out in the neighborhood and we're going door knocking. And he said, can I go? They said, sure. And, and so they, they get in the neighborhood and they go to separate. And he says, can I go to the door first? <laughs> and usually, you know, Christian wants to stand back. He wanted to go to the door. And he did. And according to the testimony, that person professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior right there on the doorstep. And his testimony is the next three out of four doors after that did as well. And he said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Footsteps in the work. As we've said probably every week, we're qualified to be a witness for Jesus just as soon as we're saved because we can tell someone else what Jesus did for us. That's what this man did. Baby footprints in the work. Footsteps in the work. And he said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. That'll bring about compassion for the lost. But not only, we, we had mentioned fellowship with Jesus. How about fellowship with faithful witnesses? I have a friend... Uh, haven't seen him in a long, long time. And I was going to avoid the subject in this story, but it's more distracting to leave it out than to say it. So anyway, this buddy of mine, we grew up on the poor side of town, and he had an aim in life. His aim was he wanted to be rich. I mean, it consumed him. He talked about it. It's all he thought about. He had a plan on how to be rich. He said... He said, you know how I'm going to be rich? I said, how are you going to get rich? He said, I'm going to, I'm going to hang around rich people. <laughs> and you know what? One way or another, he finagled his way into, I don't know what kind of job he got, but he finagled his way into being around some wealthier people. And I disagree on that being his, being anyone's number one passionate aim in life. But I will say this. He became wealthy. We need to keep fellowship with faithful witnesses. 
We need to hang around faithful witnesses. First of all, those who are faithful witnesses, they're full of compassion for the lost. Because you have to have it to do that. And when someone is consistent in that, they, they have compassion for others that, who are lost. We need to keep fellowship with faithful witnesses in person and in print. In person, as in those in the church we know of, or those Christians we know of who are faithful to it. In print, by, by those books that we could read on that, that help us with witnessing to others. Or those stories, those, you know what, testimonies of witnessing, they are so inspiring. There was a man on the radio, maybe he still is today, I don't know. But he had a one minute slot twice a day. And it was about witnessing. And, and I tell you what, I knew a lot of people that listened to him. They arranged their ride to work or their morning routine of breakfast or whatever so that they could listen to this one minute, about 6.56, 6.57 a.m., to this man. He would either teach a verse and something from the Bible about witnessing, or he would tell a story uh, about an actual witnessing event that happened. And, and so, you know, people would arrange their lunch. So about 12.56, 12.57, they could listen to this man's one-minute talk on witnessing. It was very inspiring. And it helped a lot of people to witness. We, one way or another, wh however it is, we need to stick close to faithful witnesses in every way, in order for us to grow in compassion. You know, it's contagious. It's contagious. And we need to be around those who are faithful witnesses. How about this for compassion? How about the facts of what God has placed upon us? God has given us a title in His Word, and that is Ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are His representatives. He has us to speak for Him here on earth. We have been given a word of reconciliation. We have a sermon title in the Scriptures, if you will, for our witnessing, and that is, Be Ye Reconciled to God. It's what Jesus did while He was on this earth. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, 5, says this, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation." The power of God through Christ went throughout this earth preaching a message, be reconciled to God. And now, that word of reconciliation has been given to you and I. The facts of what God has placed on us. We have been given a duty. And what a wonderful duty that we might consider a lost world in sin, separated from God. But as I said in camp a few times this year, God built a bridge with two pieces of wood and three nails that, that all of the lost could come back to God through Jesus Christ. He made us. He lost us. And He bought us back again through Jesus. And the way to God is made open through the precious Son of God. And that is our message that cannot be torn up. That is our message that will never fail. That is our message that everyone needs. That will be the message that we cannot sharing, quit sharing with the lost when we have compassion for those who are unsaved. That is a driving quality, a driving ingredient in you, in, if you will, in our nonstop witnessing. The facts are, we have placed upon us the duty 
of preaching the message to a lost and dying world. We speak for Jesus now. You know, we, we think of stewardship and stewardship month. I, I can't wait for that month every year. I, I like to teach it and I need it. And, and I'm glad we do it every January. And, and we are managers for God. Overseers of, of time and talents and treasures but also telling about Jesus. That might fall under our talents because God has given us the ability to do that. But telling about Jesus, that's what we are responsible for. We, we are saved by grace, which is free. It is freely given. But what happens to us after we are saved by the grace of God in this world and there are those out there without grace. They're without grace, and they don't deserve grace. We have grace, and we don't deserve the grace. What are we going to do with that? Paul said, I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor to, to the Gentiles, the, to the Greeks to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Paul killed, had Christians killed before he was saved, after he was saved, and after saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He had compassion on those who weren't Christians. You know, our neglect of unsaved souls could cause them to miss a home in heaven for eternity. And not only that, their blood will be on our hands. When we consider the facts of what God has placed upon us, it's going to create a longing in our souls for the lost lives that are around us. The more we consider this our divine duty, the more our hearts are going to be inspired to fulfill it. It's what God has given us to do. But how about this for compassion for the lost? How about the future that is placed upon them? We need to think about this place called hell that we're not going to. Why do we need to think about this place called hell that we're not going to? Because daily, most, most people around us that we pass, they are. In the condition that they are in right now, they are going to hell. They are headed to that place that we are not. Unless, unless they're redirected by a faithful witness. Unless a Christian full of compassion will, will open their mouths and tell of Jesus to them. Jesus was moved to die for the lost because of His compassion for the lost. Can we share His message with the lost because of our compassion for the lost? I don't want anyone to go to hell. You know, I remember in my unsaved days people that I just really did not care for. But I tell you what, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see anyone go to hell. I, I could tell you some terrible stories of some things that have happened. But we're sinners who God shed His mercy upon and gave to us and saved us. And so is everyone else out there. God wants us to share this grace that we have that we didn't deserve with the lost. The more we grow in compassion toward the lost, the more we're going to see the unsaved the way Jesus sees the unsaved. And when we view the unsaved the way Jesus does, we're going to value the opportunity that we have there the way that Jesus did. These are some things that will bring about compassion, which is a must to be a faithful witness. But what's that compassion going to bring about in our lives? Man, we're a work in progress. And God is always doing great things in us. And there's always another rung on the ladder. Let's get off that cozy Christian couch 
and, and look at that next rung that God has for us. Because He's going to grow in us in compassion. He's going to make us a faithful witness. And then, and then what's the result of that compassion going to bring about? Well, a, a completion in our lives. We're not perfected until we get to heaven. But we're being perfected right now by God. He is working. He is the potter and we are the clay. And He is working in us to perfect us. And we are not going to come near being complete without compassion for unsaved souls. There is going to be a gaping hole. There is going to be a, 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 a huge emptiness within us if we don't have compassion for those who are lost. It means more of Christ's power in our lives whenever we grow in compassion. That the result of that is go we're going to be able to become a more powerful witness the more we have compassion for that soul standing before us. No, no, matter, no matter what they say, no matter what their response is, it's an important part of our completion, compassion is. You know, John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. You know, we have fellowship with God's people. And thank God for that. I look forward to it every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I look forward to meeting with the people of God, not just here, but when we meet outside of church. And, and I love meeting with the people of God. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. I need you desperately, and I love our fellowship. And you love fellowship with one another. But if we don't go outside these walls to the lost... And those rivers of living water, if they're not flowing out of us, look, we don't have this full life that Jesus says He came to give. That word uh, abundantly, it means full. And it's not a full Christian experience without, without lunging toward those who are headed toward the flames of hell, as it were. That we, that we might reach them out, that they might be saved from their sins. You know, something else that, that it's going to bring about, anyone ever get restless or discontent when, when, you, when we feel like we've just come up short on being faithful on what we should do for God? Thank God for His conviction. I'm thankful for that conviction that, that keeps us in line or brings us back to where we're supposed to be. That discontentment when we're not doing all that we should be doing. But also the peace. You know, then you think of the peace that we have when daily in our lives we are busy about God's will. By His grace, He's growing us up, He's maturing us, and we're busy about His will as we should be. It's, it's very satisfying. It's very fulfilling to do God's will. Especially walking away from a soul who you have thrown the spiritual life preserver out to, you have told them about Jesus, and then when you turn around and walk away from that soul, you know God's promise that His Word does not return void. You know that a seed has been planted, or maybe it's been watered. And you walk away satisfied from that soul, no matter what their response is. No matter what kind of rejection might have come your way. If you haven't read the Morning Manna yet today, look at it tonight before you go to sleep. It was a wonderful write-up on this subject, and it has to do with the rejection that comes about. But we walk away with the peace that passeth all understanding because we have done God's will. The sacrificial experience is even something we can appreciate. Jesus says, if they hate you, they hated me first. You know, and, and a verse I get hung up on a lot, 
Paul says that I may know Him in the fellowship of His sufferings. When we are rejected as a witness, we know a little bit about what our Lord and Savior went through. And He definitely knows what we're going through when we, when we do it. And He's pleased. It's a sacrificial experience that's to be appreciated by us because our Lord went through it as well. It's a consistent experience to be a faithful witness. Look, the busier we are in sharing the gospel, the better we're going to be. It seems like this world has, has their plan of, of working as little as possible and having as much time as they can. I tell you what, I, I don't really want, I don't like idle time. I really don't. I, idle time is dangerous. When we sit there with idle time, molehills become mountains concerning problems going on or problems we think are going on. If we have too much time to think about it, that's dangerous. The busier we are sharing Jesus, the better. Because you know what we're going to do in our downtime when we've shared Jesus and we can hear the things that people say just, just over and over as, as we go sit and contemplate what has happened for the day. You know what we're doing? We're being filled with compassion because we're thinking about those souls. We're thinking about those souls maybe who, are, who, who were just almost right there today. And it seem, just seems like maybe they were about to be saved. Or the one who was so determined they were going to get to heaven a different way. And we just sit and we pray for them and we become filled with compassion for the lost. That, that's a great thing to do in downtime. But just to have empty idle time, it's devastating to our lives. It, it, things become exaggerated for the worse in idle time. Compassion makes such a connection to a complete, satisfied, confident, sacrificial, full experience in our spiritual lives. Prayer, faith, and compassion for the lost. These are huge keys to our witnessing. I've, I've taught some, some series on witnessing before, and it was about what to say. And, you know, and it was about how to respond to this or that. And there's a good time for that, and a good need for that. But I tell you what, God takes care. If, if we'll be in prayer, if we'll be growing in faith, if we'll be growing in compassion for unsaved souls going to hell, you know what? A lot of those words are going to come about. Not so much about the pattern as the passion within that's going to happen. Compassion for the lost is much more than praying at the end of a service. I mean, we may be, and I hope we are, praying at the end of, the, of a service and we have a burden for someone certain or maybe five people we believe might be unsaved in this or, or just whoever, Lord, that someone would be saved. That's wonderful to have that burden inside. But it, but it needs to be more than just at the end of two or three church services a week. True compassion cultivated and matured in us is it's going to move us to reach the lost. And it's going to be something that will consume our lives. We might, we might close tonight with asking ourselves the question, do I have compassion for those who are lost, who need to be saved by Jesus? How, how can we answer that? How might we answer that? Well, it, it might come to our minds how, how often we tell someone about Jesus. How often that happens in our daily lives when we go outside those walls. That's going, that's going to be a determining help, a help concerning a determining factor on how much compassion we have for those who are unsaved. 
And look, that's a, that's a good thing if... It's not a good thing if we don't have much, but it's a good thing if we realize it because we know how we can get it now. And we realize that that's what we need to be able to, to fulfill our purpose that God has given us. Amen? All right. Well, we're going to close tonight. And it's, it's so great to see everybody who is able to be here. And um, Glenn, Brother Glenn, that's who I had in mind. Will you close us in a word of prayer, sir?